getting over having woken up a short moment ago. I woke at three o'clock this morning, hadn't been back to sleep, so I, I needed a break just then. Um, why don't I start with us talking about um, Malaysia, uh, specifically in this whole issue of what's the role of debt and credit in a capitalist economy? Um, because one of the one of the great advantages of the last couple of years is the Bank of International Settlements. So, oh, pardon me, thank you. Uh, one of the great advantages of the last couple of years is the Bank of International Settlements producing a superb set of databases on private debt, which is the first time we've had a comprehensive database uh, of debt using comparable statistics across the world. And uh, of course, neoclassicals have been claiming for ages that debt doesn't matter in uh, macroeconomic, except perhaps at the zero lower bound. Well, it's news to me that uh, Malaysia and Japan were at the zero lower bound when they had their crises, but this is just a bit of a comparison. The red line is private debt to GDP, private non-financial sector, so it's household debt plus uh, non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP. And Japan uh, still has, it's not the highest level that we've ever had, I think uh, the highest was actually um, um, Holland with, uh, um, with about 240% of GDP. But that's, uh, you can see the rise and fall of debt in Japan at its crisis. Uh, Malaysia and then America. What I want to now do is look at a combination of just the debt to GDP um, and uh, credit. And I define credit as change in debt. And this is, I've been doing this work for a new book coming out in April, May, which is called Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? It's a fairly short book. Um, not just because of the, uh, the answer to the question is no, <laughs> um, but it's also just a 25,000 word book. That's the, the format that the publishers uh, put forward to me, and I think it's a, it's, a very, it's a nice, tight little format that worked very well. And what I did as part of it is invent what I wrote, developed a graph that I've called the smoking gun of credit, because you always hear in you know, neoclassicals disparaging any role for credit in capitalism, except during times when the rate of interest falls to zero, and that's another explanation for secular stagnation. But this chart I call a smoking gun of credit. And on the left-hand axis I graph for GDP and GDP plus change in private debt. And on the right-hand side I graph change in private debt as a percentage of GDP. And I'll explain the logic behind doing those, that in a moment. The adding GDP to, to, change, to change in debt is not numerically valid, but it is, it's roughly valid because most of credit is used to buy assets rather than used to buy goods and services. But So I've, I just did it today for the Malaysian economy, and as I tell my students when I show them all the data that I've got on credit, if I was trying to make my case by inventing data, I wouldn't dare make up data as outrageous as the real data actually is, because this is the pattern I got for Malaysia. <laughs> Does anybody need to be to point out where the Eurasian financial crisis was? Yeah. You had the, the black line is graphed against the right hand axis, and that peak there, and I've got 1997 as the date of the crisis. Is that when did it actually? What was the actual date in terms of the month? Does anybody know when you would which month in 1997 you'd say? July. Pardon? Early July. July. Okay. Well, this is six months wrong. So you move it. I'll actually do that on the on my program right now and just change that uh, reference point. Let's just see. So, uh, so July, so that's like seven plus seven on 12, okay. Okay, and let's just redo that chart. It won't be spot on the nail, but it's gonna be very close. Oh yeah, spot on the nail, okay. So I'll just copy that and put it on my uh, Slides here. Pardon me, going the wrong way. Ah. So that's the pattern for Malaysia. Uh, you went from credit, you must have had another crisis in about, though not as severe, in about 1987, the time of the stock market crash. But you had this huge boom where credit, which is the change in private debt, went from about 8% of GDP to 42% of GDP. At the Asian financial crisis, it plunged from plus 42 to minus 8. 
and then you had a rapid recovery. I'm sure that's a, that's a sharper recovery than I'd find for Indonesia or for uh, Singapore. I'll do that in a moment if you like, and we can just see what the comparison looks like. Actually, why don't I do it now? Um, so I'll just uh, replace that with the data for, say, well, what's a good one? Singapore, do you think, or Thailand? Which one do you think? I'll try Singapore first of all. Let's just see. It's always fun to do this for the first time. What's their currency? Dollars? I'll just leave it to Singapore, leave it at that, let's just see. Not as severe, but uh, a longer lasting crisis. And they obviously they had a hit, they took a hit during the global financial crisis as well. And now they're having a plunging level of credit demand as well. So that, that's been a very, um, even though there's empirical problems about adding the GDP to change in debt, but the, using credit or change in private debt is an indicator of when, the, when a boom is occurring and when the crisis starts. It's, it's, it's been totally foolproof in, in picking up the data. So why does the neoclassical school ignore credit? Well, it's because of the loanable funds model. And my favourite exponent of this is Paul Krugman. Uh, he's, not only does he explain it so well, he puts it so politely. Uh, so he says, think of it this way, when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. So he's arguing there's no link between the level of private debt and the level of money, fundamentally. And this, I mean, I find that language quite childish when you read it carefully. Less patient people borrowing from more patient people. It's almost like reading a child's um, nursery rhyme, the way they describe what they think the real world is. Uh, and even post-Keynesian economics hadn't, hasn't really properly integrated credit yet. So I got an, I've, I've been trying to make this case for about a decade, and some of my arguments have been wrong uh, in the sense that uh, I was trying to explain how you could have a role for change in debt and aggregate demand and income uh, while still maintaining the identity of income and expenditure. And it took me a long time to finally work out an intellectually correct way of doing it. So I put it sometimes in ways that didn't look correct. Uh, but if you look at, say, Randall Ray's primer on monetary theory, it starts from, you start from the argument that aggregate lending e level spending equals income. That's true, but it's leaving out any role for credit. And then when I got involved in a debate with uh, Brett Feibarger, Flyberger, I think it is, and um, Mark Lavoy and Tom Pally in the review of Keynesian economics a couple of years ago. Uh, Feiberger in particular said, "I've got to explain how I can how a purchase doesn't immediately provide income. I've got to leave out the idea that there's debt extensions can force an inequality, but it's not an inequality, but it plays a role. Um, and I guess it says the sector can spend more than its current income, but the sum of sectors cannot. True." But it's still possible to show there's an in intimate role for credit in aggregate demand so and in expenditure. So what I finally worked out I could do to bring the reasoning together is divide the economy into multiple sectors, and three is enough to indicate what's necessary. The sectors don't have to be goods and services producing. One of them can be assets, which is a better way to make sense of it. But imagine you have three non-bank sectors plus a banking sector. Pardon me. Ah. And you look at expenditure by each sector on the other sectors. So you're definitely looking at the, the reason for the identity of the relationship. So the expenditure by each sector is from, from its own uh, sector to the other two sectors. So the diagonal of this table I'm, I use is expenditure. And the off-diagonal elements are income. And what I'm showing is flows in dollars per year. Again, I prefer to work in continuous time, virtually everything. This, this microphone keeps on going up and down, is it? I hope it's OK. Um, so all the flows are shown in lowercase, and they are dollars per year. And in, when I bring in a stock, and of course the only stock I have here is the level of debt, 
I show that in uppercase and I use RO rather than R for the rate of interest when I bring it in. So let's just take a look at the simplest case where the banks are simply a, a, um, a system by which you know, we transfer money but they play no active role in the economy. So what you have is expenditure by sector one. Sector one is spending A dollars per year on sector two and B dollars per year on sector three. And sector two is spending C dollars per year on sector one and D dollars per year in sector three and E and F amount a bit spent by sector three on sectors one and two. Well, if you add up and take the negative of the diagonals, you get aggregate expenditure. And if you add up the sum of the off diagonals, you get aggregate income. And of course, they're identical. So that's a simple starting point. Now let's consider loanable funds, which is the neoclassical myth that banks are simply intermediaries who enable one sector to lend to another. And I just show the lending. I'm not showing any fee income by banks out of that. But I could add that there, but it would just complicate the, the diagram without bringing anything more um, meaningful into it. And what I have is sector one is borrowing L dollars per year from sector two, which means that sector one has to have an outstanding debt of L dollars, capital L per year, of capital L dollars to sector two. And therefore, sector one pays sector two interest of row times L per year, which is why they blend in the first place. So you put that together and what you find is here's the money in the sector one is now sending spending A dollars per year on sector two and B plus L dollars per year in sector three where it's borrowing the L dollars from sector two. And sector two's lending is here. It's spending it was spending D dollars per year on sector three. It's now spending D minus L dollars per year in sector three. So there's an increase in expenditure by sector one, a decrease in expenditure by sector two. They do cancel each other out. Uh, but what you find, and even this is a, I didn't expect this to turn up, but you'll see the logic behind it in a moment. You add up the diagonal and you find that the interest payments are part of aggregate expenditure. And if I include payments, if I include deposit interest there as well, they turn up as well. Not as a negative, but as a positive. So you have gross financial transactions turning up as part of aggregate expenditure here, and they are also part of aggregate income. So even if you work just in loanable funds, there's a role, a minor role for credit in aggregate demand and expenditure because gross financial transactions turn up as both part of aggregate expenditure and part of aggregate income. Now the important, the real world where you have banks creating money by lending, you get an essential role for credit out of that. So I now have sector one borrowing L dollars a year, but borrowing that from the banking sector. And then of course paying interest of row times capital L dollars per year as income to the banking sector. So now I'm actually populating these columns. I've now got the outstanding level of loans being L capital L dollars and the flow of loans in dollars per year being L dollar, little, little L dollars per year. Now you have exactly the same expenditure, but rather than paying the interest to sector two, sector one is paying it to the banking sector. And now if I add up the diagonals and get what aggregate expenditure is, it includes credit. Okay. Aggregate expenditure includes the flow of money borrowed from the banks, or created by the banks by, by lending. And of course, that also includes aggregate income. So there's a definite role for credit in aggregate demand and aggregate expenditure once you acknowledge that banks create money. It plays an essential role. You can't ignore it. If you do ignore it, you're not modelling capitalism. That's one of the many other reasons why neoclassical economics is a waste of time. And why you have to have a monetary model of capitalism. You can't model it without including money and debt. And there are two sources of expenditure. There's the turnover of existing money, which is roughly what GDP is. GDP is partly that plus some credit creation. And new expenditure, which is financed one for one by new debt. So I measure it by adding the two together. And if I add GDP to change in debt, then I'm double counting some credit, maybe about 20% of it in current circumstances, but I'm not double counting all of it. And when I look at credit alone, then I am looking at the credit contribution to aggregate uh, demand and income. And it helps me identify every crisis that's happened uh, since and including Japan. So here's Japan's picture. And you, if you take a look at the level of credit, it started to plunge 
just before the crisis began. It's normally been negative since then. If you add credit to GDP, you find it that the sum peaked in 1990 when their crisis is regarded as having started. And though nominal GDP has risen somewhat since the crisis began, the sum of credit plus GDP has not reached the level that it was back in 1990 ever since. And looking at credit in the five years before the crisis, it averaged about 18% of GDP. After the crisis, it's been averaging about minus 2%. So there's been a total absence of credit-based demand in the Japanese economy for one quarter of a century now. That's how long we can go on making this mistake. The United States... Same story. The crisis began when credit reached a peak of 15% of GDP and then started to decline. Hit negative, the economy recovered when that started to rise again. And it's now back in positive territory once more, though notice it's only about 5% of GDP, which is well below the peaks it reached back in the boom period beforehand, which is why with stagnant demand you've had stagnant growth as well. Before the credit uh, before the crisis, it averaged about 11% of GDP. Since the crisis, about 3.5% of GDP. And now if I plot... This is the chart where I'm plotting... I think I've got a little... Oh, no, I haven't got the illustrator. Let's go back. Okay. Here I'm plotting what was applying at the time of the, the global financial crisis with the level of debt on the horizontal <coughs> axis and the rate of change of debt, which is credit, on the vertical. And look at the countries which are in the, the hot spots here. Spain and Ireland, Denmark as well, but Denmark and Netherlands both had a crunch at the time of the crisis. The US and the UK, just in that region, but a whole range of other countries, Finland, Belgium, Hong Kong, Sweden, Portugal, uh, that's New Zealand, and I can't make out what that one is there <laughs> underneath the... It's just too badly obscured. It's something in here with Y, D-Y. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, now let's look. I think we've got now we're out in, in 2016, and the outstanding countries in the danger zone. Ireland is back there again, which I find ridiculous, uh, but true at the same time. China, we know, has got, gone from a relatively low level of debt back at the before the, at the crisis to massive level now, and very dependent upon credit. Hong Kong, the same. And then down here you have Korea, uh, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Sweden and Norway, all in the danger zone of well over 150% of GDP as their debt level, and credit being responsible for 10% or more of aggregate demand. So they're all vulnerable. And Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand are back just on the cusp here. They're just below 1.5 times GDP as the debt level but credit of 10 to 15 percent. And the, what you're seeing in that data, if you take a look at those, that chart I did a moment ago, let's go back and take a look at um, that one, okay. You can see how now credit has, having reached 15 percent of GDP again is starting to turn down. So I've got a feeling there's a bit of a slump going on in the Malaysian economy right now. When you look at the aggregate of the two, it's actually turned around again. So that's good reason to expect Malaysia to be approaching a bit of a crunch right now. And that's that's what I see as the danger zone. Debt greater than 1.5 times GDP and credit greater than 10% of GDP. So looking at that, I identify Ireland, Hong Kong, China, Canada, Australia, Korea, Sweden, Norway and Belgium as fairly likely and possibly Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. But they could you can go on for some years with the dynamic from extra credit, giving you extra demand, giving you an apparent boom until it all comes crunching down. So Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand have a bit of room to move into that danger zone, but these countries are already well and truly there. So that's just a bit of a background on why credit matters. And what I want to do now is just illustrate that that, that reality that credit matters is why I designed Minsky, uh, because there are plenty of system dynamics programs in existence. Engineers have been creating these programs since the mid-60s. I think the very first one was called SIMPLE. And I think it stands for Simulation... 
Well, there's some simulation with lots of equations or some title like that, and there's another one called Dynamo. So they were the very early programs. And Simulink, which is part of MATLAB, dominates the engineering world these days. Vensim uh, dominates the system dynamics community, which is mainly used in management and areas like that. Um, they're all... I, they're very good. They're good programs. I, my favourite one in the, in the field is actually called VizSim, which I think has got a much better interface than, than Simulink. Um, there's lots to be said for some of the components of VenSim, but I find the in, interface rather primitive and rather off-putting. So I'm, I'm trying to design something better than, than that. But the main reason I did it was because of the banking icon you can see here, because when you try to model financial flows using those programs, as Minsky argued, and as you'll find anybody doing accounting knows, to properly record financial flows, you need to enter the same transaction four times. Okay? It'll be from one account to another account through a banking system, which gives you four times the same term can come up. When you try to do that using flowchart elements, you get wires leading everywhere, and it's really hard to read. So it occurred to me some about, or oh, maybe a decade ago, was I could actually generate the differential equations using double entry bookkeeping or using tables. And I've now, I've since realised the importance of double entry bookkeeping in that. So I want to give a quick demo of how you build the, the financial components of a model in Minsky. You can barely see the icon there on the screen given the colour, but that's a little bank type icon. So you double click and you get a table. And I didn't realise the importance of double entry bookkeeping when I first designed Minsky. So it doesn't actually force assets, liabilities and equity, which is the fundamental law of accounting. When I get enough funding, I'm going to get, it, get this redesigned so it automatically divides into assets, liabilities and equity. But what you have to do is click on this button here which says no asset class and then choose asset, for example. So I'm going to create something called reserves. And when I click this plus button, you'll see that the icon has now put a little... Sorry? Oh, hang on. You want to do that? Let's take a look. Now. Ah, so you got it there. Okay. No, um, you actually double click and it comes up, or you right click and it comes up. You actually got two tables there. Oh, it's so faint. It's puzzling. Okay. So you've now got two banking icons. So you either double click or you right click and choose that. Choose that and drop the table. And then click on asset class and choose asset, and you can then type it. Okay. okay. I'll slow down now because people are actually used to trying to keep up with me, so I'll do this a bit slowly. So I'll just type one column called reserves, and I'll now have another one I'll call loans, and then click the plus button again and create another column. And let's click on asset and go for liability, and I'll choose firms type firms in, click again and have say workers and then click again and I'll call this bank because this is the bank's equity. I'm going to change that from being a liability to being equity and let's just stretch the box out so you can see the final row, final column which is doing a row sum and what the program does is it enforces that the sum of all rows must be zero. Okay. If you don't have it summing up to zero, then it'll tell you, but it'll show a non-zero sum there, which means you haven't got the, the, the flows aren't properly balanced. Well, let's put an initial condition. Let's imagine an initial reserves to say 100. And notice when I click over here, the row sum is now 100. Well, let's say loans are 10. So you show loans and assets are shown as a positive. So to make sure the row sums to zero, this is accounting convention, liabilities and equity are shown as negative. So let's say I've got, say, minus 20 in the firm's accounts, uh, which showing it as a minus is seeing it from the bank's point of view. Okay? So even though it's a, from the firm's point of view, that's 20 billion ringgit that they can spend. From the bank's point of view, it's a 20 billion dollar ringgit liability they have to the to the firm sector. I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll put minus 70 in the workers and I've now to make it balanced that I have minus 20 for the bank equity. So that's now given me the initial conditions. And if I now click over here on the plus, I now insert a row where I can have some operations. Let's just have, for example, have lend money. 
and that's just a, a text description. So what you now do is you type a word, and we're probably going to change the convention here at some stage. I'm going to type line, lend underscore f, f standing for firms, and now the program is telling me that my row sum is now positive with lend underscore f inside there, so I need to type minus lend underscore f and click, and you'll see the row sum is now zero. And notice over here on the bank icon, you can see that I've now got lend and then subscript f. So the lend underscore, the underscore is a, 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 a language convention in latex. The latex uses the underscore to indicate lowercase, or a, a subscript for the next character. Let's click a, another row and I'll add pay interest. And I'll have, say, int underscore f here, and then have minus int underscore f in the bank equity column, which means the bank's the interest is being paid to the equity account of the bank. That's where their income comes from. The banks tell me it's more complicated than that, but that's this is a simple way. This is this is actually a simplifying assumption. Okay. Then the repay the debt. So that's going to be a payment from the uh, firm account. And the, the convention effectively is the same as engineers use for describing electrical flows. They have from being a plus and to being a minus. Even though we electrons, we define them being as negative and they flow in the opposite direction. So the convention is plus is the origin or the source and minus is the destination or the sink. So I have repay, that means then you have minus repay and that makes a lot of sense because you're actually reducing the level of debt that you owe. So that's now three columns. Let's say I'll add pay wages. So I'll call this, I'll have a positive entry here for wages and minus wages in the workers' liability column. And then I'll have two, just two elements for consumption by workers and consumption by bankers. So I'll have CONS underscore W for consumption by the workers, which of course they pay to the firm sector. And I'm going to make a deliberate mistake in the next row just to show you what the program does. So I'm going to have, say, consumption by bankers. Let's so have CONS underscore B. And let's just imagine that over here I accidentally type CON underscore lowercase b. Well, the program catches that because they're not the same. So if you want to edit that, you have to click in the column and then, of course, delete and type in the B. And I've made another mistake because I've now got positives in two locations. So what I need to do here, if I type in, the, in, the, in that, co in that uh, box and hold down the control key, this is a, a, the, one of the interface routines that we've used. We've probably, we'll try to improve this over time, but this is what we do. Hold the control key down and each press of the arrow key takes you one character further sideways. Then I type minus, and now that makes it into minus consumption, and the, the rows are now balanced. So I'll save that, control S for save, uh, and let's work that in the workshop. Okay, so now what I've got is Five, six financial operations on five accounts. And what I now want to do is do some defining of them. And here, again, we, we have to improve this over time, but what you have to do at the moment to access something is to right-click and choose Copy. If I now copy Lend F, I've now got that little icon, and I can do that for each of them. Let's, let's, let's bring down I and TF first of all. So I right-click, choose Copy, and bring it down here. Now, interest payments are obviously related to the level of loans that are outstanding. So if I right click on loans and choose copy, I can do the same thing then bring, bring loans down here as well. And of course, if you multiply loans by the interest rate, you get the amount of lending that's going on. So I'm just gonna type on the screen R, lowercase r, underscore L. And that's now created another variable called R underscore, R lower, uh, subscript L for interest on loans, the rate of interest on loans. And if I now come here and just press the multiply key, it puts an icon which is a multiply icon. And what you actually do to define 
uh, any operation is you notice when I when I move on to one of these um, items, I'll make it a bit. I can make it larger so you can see what I'm actually doing more clearly by multiplying a bit. If I hold down the shift key, notice that the shape of the cursor changes. And I can now drag it up, and now you can see things on a larger scale. So when I go here, a little when I hover over a, one of the objects, a little circle appears. The same for this one, and the same here. If I click and drag, that brings out an arrow. And it's set up so that if you're within reach of another input, let go and it'll go straight to the input. Now having done that, oh, it hasn't actually done generated an equation yet. It'll, it'll take, it takes a bit of time to do that. I'll just put a rate of interest. I'll define the rate of interest now. So right click and choose edit and say it's uh, 5%, so 0 0.05 and I'm going to define it as a parameter because I'm not actually determining it in the model. I'm setting it as a, a value externally at the moment. So it changes to a blue box and notice that uh, on this, when, when, when something can be defined as a flow and contribute to other flows and the circle occurs at both ends of the icon and there's a slight little wedge here. When something is a, a stock and it can only be a um, um, it has to be. It's defined in the in the table itself, the Godly table. And there's normally a circle at one end, and a parameter you can't define for the other end. But anything which has can be defined as a flow and contribute to something else has a circle at both ends. And if I also right click on that, I can make this. Actually, I'll make a copy of it. I want to illustrate this elsewhere. Come up here, and I then right click and choose a slider. And the slider gives you a little bar, which means you can change the value in your model. Obviously, the range is wrong there. So I'm going to say it starts at, I'm going to take an initial value of 0.05, which is 5%. Get a maximum value of 20%, so 0.2. A minimum of uh, 0. And do it in steps of, uh, of 1%. Oh, that's cute. And I've got an error message there. What did I do? What did I do wrong? Let's see. Ah, actually, yeah, you're right. I've got I've an extra, extra five, extra dot there. Good. That's actually a genuine error. <laughs> Some of the error messages in Minsky were bugs. But that's not an error message. That, that's that's a genuine error. Okay. So now, if you notice, whenever I move the mouse over that the, the top level, a little box turns up. When that's there, I can use the arrow keys to go sideways and change the amounts, and I can do that during the simulation as well. If you hold the control key down, you move in larger steps. So that's a little way to use it as a control panel. So having done that, let's see if the equations are now turning up. Yep, okay, now what you can see is that the, we've now started defining a dynamic system. So there's no definition for consumption by bankers or workers, lending by firms, repayment or wages, but there's the rate of interest. Interests are equal to loans multiplied by the rate of interest on loans, and then here are all the dynamic equations for the financial flows in the system. And it's fairly, what I, what I used to do was write these differential equations directly. But the problem was you had to make sure that you had, the matching signs had to be correct in all the equations, and that was a real pain. But when you do it over here, I'll just go back to normal scale and centre that up to the top there. Um, you can't make an error in this because if you do make an error, the program points up, I hope the row sum not being zero. So, having done that, so I'll just quickly go through and try to define a whole model. So, lending to the firm sector, I'll have that being some rate of lending depending on the current level of outstanding loans. So, if I have the current level of loans divided by a time constant, so if I type the divide by key, you type directly onto the canvas here and it generates the object. Now you can just go up here and click as well, but it's faster to type the elements directly onto the screen. So I'm going to describe, I'm going to type now backslash T-A-U, which is the Greek word tau, underscore L, and press the enter key. And that's now giving me a Greek character, tau, tau lowercase L, on the screen. I'll make it larger again so you can see that more clearly. Shift, and you can use that to move it around. So now I've got tau L. I'm dividing tau L by, loans by tau L to determine the, the flow of lending. I'll just put a, a value inside here. Uh, I'm going to give a value for that of 7. Now what that means is 
that every seven years the outstanding level of loans will, will increase by 63%. That's called a time constant. It's, it's like a, it's, it's, a, it's the inverse of a half-life, effectively. So engineers use this because... <coughs> pardon me. Engineers use time constants rather than like an arbitrary number because the time constant actually means something. I could, I could give a value there of 0.14, you know, which is pretty much the inverse of, of 7 and then say loans are growing by the, uh, say the, 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 the loans are growing by 14% per annum that's the same as saying they'll roughly double in 7 years so when you work with the time constant you get a more meaningful number it's easier to work out what you should do to, to make it make sense but I'll, you'll see what I mean when I start varying this later so there's my rate of lending and I can also make that into a parameter so I'll call it a parameter rather than a value. Again, this could be something which is determined by the system itself. In a, proper, a full model could have feedbacks from the economic activity affecting how fast banks lend and so on, but I'll make it a parameter just for ease of de demonstrating. Also, make a copy of that and make it into a slider. And I'll give that a range of between starting in seven years, but say lending might be take as long as 20 years to double and can double as fast as every three years with the step sizes of one. And now let's just go back to the normal scale and I'll drag that up here because I want to I want to vary some of these as we do a simulation in a moment. And if I click to the zero, you can see that resets the origin as well. So that the object in the leftmost corner becomes where the where the screen uh, converges. So I've got lending defined here. And I'm going to use a time constant approach as well for each of the other elements I define and you'll, I think I hope you'll see why I regard it as a better way of modelling than using uh, straight numbers. I'm just going to drag some of these things around a bit just to tidy up. Now let's, let's define repayment and use the same sort of idea for repayment that repayment is also based on the current level of loans. I mean, if you want to copy something you right click and choose copy. And I'm going to have under, backslash tau underscore r for repayment. And I'll, I'll quickly now go and I'll make a copy of that, take that up here, right click on that and uh, edit it. Give that a value of say 9. So I've got loans doubling every 7 years and repayment halving loans every 9 years, which means overall loans are growing faster than they're being repaid. Now, some parts of the program are a bit kludgy here, unfortunately. Again, when I make it into a slider, I lose that particular part of the definition. We have to fix that up, but that's just a case of getting pro you know, money to pay for programming. And again, I'll give it the same idea, maximum of 20, minimum of three, steps of one. So now I've got, and you can see it's also gone to zero again. Let's just actually move it up. Oh, hang on, that didn't work at all. Well, I had to double click and what, what happened there? Okay. Sometimes just errors happen. You have to go back and fix them up. I don't know why I did that. Okay, now, there we go. So I've got rate of interest of 5%. Loans doubling debt every seven years. Repayments reducing them every nine years. And I now need to make up the mathematics. So I type a divide by a key here and then just drag the components together like so. And now if you take a look on the equations tab, we've now defined repayments as being equal, the flow of repayments being loans divided by the time constant for repayment. And we've now got two of the, or three of the six elements defined to get a full model. So now let's just define the last three. So wages, I'm going to relate wages to the amount of money in the firm's, in the banking sec, in the firm's bank account. So if I come down here and choose, right check and choose the firm's icon, and say that there's some rate of wages, rate at which the firm sector's money is turned over into wages. Pardon me, I've got a runny nose affecting my capacity to talk right now. It's going to go down well on the YouTube recording. Okay. And I'll call this tau underscore... Um, I just tau underscore W will do. I'd, I'd make a more complicated model if I was doing a genuine one, but this is just faster just to 
talk about the, the amount of money that the firms have generating wage payments. Again, same story, take a copy of it, whack it up here, and then I'll go through the redefinition, make it into a parameter. Initial value of 0.25, which means the amount of money in the firm sector turns over four times a year. Okay? 0.25 is one quarter of a year. And now I've got to go through the same rigmarole of defining a slider and then going back and changing those values so I can make it back to point <coughs> Pardon me, 0.25 again. Give a maximum of 1 and say a minimum of 0.2 and do in step pies of 0.05. And that just leaves defining consumption by workers and consumption by bankers. Well, again, consumption by workers I'm going to base on what's in the workers' bank accounts. And I'm just going to say underscore t uh, uh, backslash tau underscore, and I'm going to type curly brackets cw close curly brackets. And what the curly brackets do is tell LaTeX to subscript everything within the curly brackets. So you now see I've got two letters subscripted there. I'll make a mistake with the bankers and show you what happens when you do that. So same story. Right click, choose a copy, put it over here, and again I'll go through, make it into a parameter. Give it a value of 0.05, and what that means is bank of workers turn over the amount of money in their bank accounts 20 times a year, okay. which means every you know, roughly two and a half, three weeks, they're spending all the money in their bank account, which again implies the level of lack of wealth that workers have individually. Now again, same thing, make it into a slider, goes back to zero again, back to make it 0.05, let's say, give it a maximum value of, say, 0.25, so they take them a quarter of a year to spend the money in their account, a minimum of 0.02, so they've, they, they spend their accounts every week, which is one-fiftieth of a year, and give it a step side of 0.01. Okay, and I'll do now the same for, for... Now I need to have to type the divide by key. So workers' bank accounts divided by the time constant of consumption by workers is consumption by workers, and the final one is consumption by bankers. So copy that, bring it down here, get hold of the bank account, which is their equity account of which they can spend. And I'm now going to type backslash TAU underscore CB, and you'll see what happens. Now, the C is subscripted, the B is not. Okay. So latex is subscripted to the first character, after the subscript command, unless you put it in curly brackets. So if I double click here, I can come up here to the definition and then I can type the curly brackets in here to correct that error. Make it into a parameter. Same thing, give it an initial value. I, I'm doing initial value even though I know it overwrites it because we did have a bug at one stage. If you didn't provide an initial value, it would crash. Okay, so I'm just, I don't want to crash in the middle of giving a demo. So I'll give it a value of one, meaning workers, bankers, could live for a year on what's in their bank accounts, which is obviously saying they're wealthier than workers are. So let's just go and, and now um, take... Uh, hang on, what happened there? Yeah, okay, I've still got to type the curly brackets up there. I thought I did that. Let's do that again. Okay, now it's, now it's done them in lower case. So again, I'll take a copy of that, put it here, make it into a... Hang on. Right click and choose slider. Again, we have to make all this stuff easier to easier to use at some stage. Give it a value, a maximum value of say two years, and a mirror, minimum of half a year with step size of one tenth of a year. And now, if I have type my divide by key here, and banks divided by is consumption by bankers. I'll now save that. And now, if you look at the equations, we're defined everything. All the parameters are defined, all the flows are defined, the initial values are given, and the final transactions between, between um, um, bank accounts are shown. So let's graph some of this stuff. So I click here on a plot, I'll bring a few plots down, one there, another one down here, and a third one. And let's just graph some of these elements. So let's, let's graph the bank accounts themselves. So I'm going to make a copy of reserves. And now drag across to the black icon and reserves will be plotted in the black line. Right click and choose loans. Loans will be plotted on the red. And plot the amount of money in the firm's account. 
and let's plot the workers and the bankers on the next one down. I can, I can, I can plot up to eight lines on one chart, but that gets a bit messy, so I'll put a few of them in separate locations. And now when I also plot down here, I can plot the variables. So I'll plot what wages are. And uh, what um, consumption by workers is? Where's uh, so where's consumption by workers? Copy that. Okay. And now let's just make it a bit more attractive. So if I right click, one option is to resize. Someone is calling on my phone. <laughs> Hang on a second. I've got to answer this. Is hi. <laughs> um, I better turn it off. I'll have to explain when I get back home why I turn the phone off for the stop. Okay. Um, so that's to find those flows. Options is how we currently give titles. So I'll say uh, accounts and uh, years is the time dimension, and uh, let's say dollars as the dollars per year as the flow. Oh no, dollars, pardon me, because that's actually stocks. And here I've got, uh, let's make this the flow, so I'll just I'll option this up. This is wages and consumption. Again, years, and this is now dollars per year. And we're still getting the formatting right. You can see the formatting doesn't quite fit there. I'll choose resize and rubber band it out of it. It's a bit better like that. We're still have to do a lot of work on the cosmetics. I'll do the same thing here. Resize this, drag it out. Okay, but I won't put some labels on there yet. I'll save that again. Now let's just simulate. And what you've got, as you can see, happening slowly over time, is a rising amount of money in the firm's accounts and in loans. And if I increase the rate of, let's say repayment happens more slowly, so it's rather than paying, repaying every nine years, it's repaying every 10, then you'll see the system accelerates. Even more so if lending happens more rapidly. But then if I have lending happening more slowly and repayment more quickly, you get a downturn in the economy caused by those financial dynamics. Let's go back to the initial situation again. Of seven, I'll say seven and nine is fine. And reset that. So that's a simple monetary model in Minsky. Get the idea? It's a lot further to go, but that's the, the basic idea of being able to model financial flows. I'll make a couple of other changes as well. That's just showing the banking sector, showing the economy from the banking sector's point of view. But let's make a bit of space here, just drag some of the objects around. Put another banking icon in here. And I'm going to look at it now from the point of view of the firm sector. So I'm going to say, let's look for assets. Now at the moment, Somebody's one person's asset is another person's liability. That at much the neoclassicals get right. They don't know what to do with it there. So if I now say let's what assets, notice there's a down arrow here. Well, that shows what are the available ass liabilities which haven't been allocated to somebody's assets. So if I click on firms, the program instantly populates all the operations that affect the firms, the, the bank account for the firms, and now it's showing what were positive for the for the bank is negative and vice versa. So I've got the assets there. I now need to look at liabilities. And finally, what I want to have is look at the equity situation for this particular group. So what are the available liabilities? Well, the liabilities are current loans. And of course, the banks, the firms have loans from the banking sector. If I click on loans, the program then populates the matching rows where that's happening. So lending minus lending, repay plus repay. And now I've got to show Notice the column sums are still not correct. So uh, obviously there's, if their firms have $20 in initial assets and $10 in initial loans, their initial equities position is going to be shown as minus 10. That fix up, fix, fixes up the, um, 
the uh, initial conditions, and now I simply have to type that consumption by bankers adds to the firm's equity, so does consumption by workers. Uh, interest payments reduces it, so you show that as a positive. And wages reduce it, so you show that as a positive as well. And I've now got two views of the financial system. Notice this says Godly 1953. It's just a random... That's just a text label at the moment, but if I label that the firms, at least it labels it. We'll probably make use of that at a later stage. So I'm now seeing the, the system from the point of view of the, of the firms and the banks. So I'll just make private banks here. And, of course, I can add another one in, which I'll, I'll do off to make some space for it. Um, we're still not very good on grouping and moving things around, unfortunately. We're getting better, but uh, it's, it's taking some redesign to make this work well. And I'll take a, take a bit of risk. I'll save that, and I'll just rubber band from here. And that now, what well, goes is contrasted. If I now right-click in that region and choose group, then I get a fairly ugly looking group icon. Drag it down, you'll see things don't work very well, but ultimately the function is okay. So I've moved it down to this location. Now if I choose ungroup, then I've moved that whole region down. So there's lots of work to be done to make groups work better, but that'll do for now. Bring another bank icon down and call this the central bank. Go for assets here, and I'll just make this CB underscore, I'll say PB underscore loans. And I forgot to type in the curly brackets, so I'll do that now. And then say, okay, what liabilities are there? Well, the only liability hasn't been allocated so far as reserves. And now I've got to make that row sum accurate, so the initial conditions here is going to be uh, 100. So I've now, in this way, I've started to integrate the central bank into the model as well. And if I had another bank, then I could have reserves being used to make transfers between the accounts and so on. So, so that's using Minsky to build the financial flow model. You can also use it for flowcharts, and you can do the, so both flowcharts and the banking in the one system. But I haven't, we haven't yet forced stock flow consistency between the two. So you can make stock flow errors, and I've done that myself a couple of times uh, in models. So that's the one area where, again, I need development funding to be able to fix up those weaknesses in the design. <coughs> Pardon me. Well, now, I'll just use a separate uh, table. You can have multiple instances of Minsky open at one time. So I've got two instances running right now. I wish my nose would stop being a pain. Very annoying trying to talk while you sniffling. So now we're going to use the, is the flow chart side of the program. And I'll build a very fast Goodwin model, which is Richard Goodwin. Is an, actually, I haven't included Goodwin in my references. I must do that. Uh, he's an incredibly important dynamic model in economics, very much neglected, but I think one of the great intellects in economics. And in future years, I people will talk about Goodwin and forget about Friedman. But now what I'll do is build a a dynamic model using um, Goodwin's logic. So I'm going to start by typing L for labour. Labour is going to be a variable. Of course, if you divide labour by population, I'll use N for the number of people. If you divide labour by the number of uh, labour, the number of people with a job, by the number of people, then you've got the employment rate. So I'll, again, I'll use lambda. So I type backslash L A M B D A. And that, the program reads that as being the Greek letter lambda. I'll just make this a bit larger so you can see what I'm doing here. So now I've defined the employment rate that way. I don't know that the equations will turn up yet. It takes a while for those equations to start getting formatted. And now I'm going to have a Phillips curve. That's, so that's how you have... That's the level of people that actually have a job. I'm going to type L-A-M-B-D-A underscore Z for zero. As the and make that a parameter, which is the level of employment at which workers don't demand wage rises. So right-click on that, uh, edit it, give it a value of 0 0.6, say when 60% of the population has a job, there are no uh, additional wage demands made. 
I could have it as a as a as a parameter, but I'll make it into a slider, and uh, I have it as a, I could have it as a variable, but I'll just to make it simple, I'll make this a um, parameter. Give us say, a maximum value of zero point seven, a minimum of zero point five, so you can you can vary the values uh, if you wanted to to see what the impact would be on the model over time. So you see, it's gone back to zero. That's that should be there. We are okay. So now I say let's subtract the actual level of unemployment uh, of employment from this target level. I've now got the gap between what employment is and the level at which workers can demand wage rises. So I multiply that by backslash L A M B D A underscore capital S for slope, and I'll do the same story with that. Make it into a a um, parameter. So edit it. I'll give it a value of ten. Again, these things can all be variables. It's just a simplicity I'm making them into, into parameters. Make it into a slider, and we lose the value. 10, maximum of, say, 20, minimum of 1, slope, step size of 1. And if you multiply that by the gap between actual employment and that zero level, then you've effectively got your Phillips curve. Let's see if the equations are turning up yet. Yeah. Um, not fully, but you can see unemployment is employment is now defined as labour divided by population. It's just a various time lags in the program making these making these changes. Okay, so that's now. If you like, I can call this the Phillips curve. So it's just so suppose it's called P underscore curly brackets lowercase F M for function. That's my Phillips curve function. And I define it simply by dragging the pointer there. That should now give us a Phillips curve to find over here. Well, with that, if you then multiply that by wages, you then have the rate of change of wages. And that's where an integral block up here comes in. Because these programs all work with integration rather than differentiation. It's just because they're simulated numerically and integration is a much more stable operation than differentiation. So they do this by using integral blocks. So let's just click on integral block and bring that down. Double click and I'll call that W for wages and give uh, a lowercase w I'd better use and give it an initial value of say 0 0.8. And now I want to do is say wages multiplied by the Phillips curve integrated is the rate of change of wages. So I right click here, one of my choices as well as copy, which copies the entire block, is copy var for copy the variable only. So I've now copied w, bring it over here, type multiply, and then link those together, and you'll see more clearly when I show you the equations. I've now defined a differential equation saying the rate of change of wages is the Phillips curve multiplied by the current value of wages. Unfortunately, we don't have it set up yet that we can actually amplify. Like I can't. If I click here, I don't make those equation blocks larger. Unfortunately, uh, that only currently affects the uh, the design palette, not the um, not the equation. So again, that's something else we just need funding to be able to write the code. So I'll save this. I'm just going to call this go across to the workshop tab and call this Goodwin. Uh, 1967, because that's when he wrote the paper. Give you a bit of a, a clue. Okay, so I've now got. Let's just recenter that. So I've got labour divided by population gives you the employment rate, which feeds into a Phillips curve function, giving you the wage level. But if you now multiply the wage level by labour, so I'm going to take a copy of L and bring it over here. Again, I'll make this a bit larger so you can see what I'm doing. Multiply labour's labour by the wages bill. Of course, you've now got total wages. Let's call that capital W. And if I now subtract labour from out, uh, wages from output, I'm going to type Y for output here, which I haven't yet defined. If I subtract wages from output. In this simple two-class model, it's going to be profit. So I'm going to use backslash capital P and I. Again, notice the program doesn't instantly 
make things the right size. And I've got a typing mistake there. I must have typed a space key. Double click. Uh, I see what I've done. Delete that and type the backslash key properly. And that's now profits. So again, the program recognises. I mean, I mean, cap, uh, uppercase you know, Greek P. There's profits. Let's just drag this over a bit and make it a bit smaller. So that's profit. In, Go in Goodwin's simple model, he had all profit being invested. So I type capital I for investment. Notice that's down the bottom there. I now want to link the two together. So I drag from here down to here. Now why have I... That, that looks a bit ugly. If I right click and choose flip, I turn it round by 180 degrees and now I can actually go in the opposite direction and come back over here. So I know investment, of course, is the rate of change of capital stock. So I need to bring in capital stock here. And we use a number of keyboard shortcuts to write these characters quickly on screen. I've been going up and clicking on the icon to do that, which I could do again. But if you type the ampersand key, the idea is the ampersand key looks like an integral sign. So we'll type one there directly. And if I now call this K for capital, let's give it an initial value of 300. Then I've now got capital stock there. And I want to include depreciation. So I'm going to right click on K, choose copy variable, come over here and multiply K by delta K. So I'm going to go backslash DELTA underscore capital K and call it, that's going to be the rate of depreciation. And let's again make that into a parameter, give it a value of say 6%. Oops, that's cute. What happened there? Ah, I must... Yeah, I mean... I'm a bit... No, no, it's put up a delta K. Let's see if it's turned up somewhere. Okay, that's an error. I'll just go and reset and see if I can spot where delta K got to. Maybe I deleted it. I'll just, I'll just, if, you, if you highlight something you don't want it, press the delete key. It deletes it straight away. I'll try and type in delta K again. Ah. Ah, it's shown as a constant. I want it to be a parameter. That was my mistake. Thank you. I, did, I, I didn't hear you properly. So delta underscore k here. Ooh. Okay, it looks like a real buck there. Invalid access of variable type undefined. Cool. I made a real mistake. Yeah, okay, I'm going to ignore that. Let's delete it. I'll leave depreciation out. I may, I may have stuffed it up. I hope I haven't. Let's see what happens here. So I'm just going to have capital investment being the rate of change of capital. Of course, if you then defined output and take a copy of output, if you define um, capital by an accelerator, so I'll use V for the accelerator, and divide capital by the accelerator, I've then got the capital output ratio. And I then divide, uh, let's drag it right over here. If I then divide that by labour productivity, type LP for labour productivity, let's say it takes one worker to make one unit of output, and divide that, and this is going to look a bit messy. Um, I haven't used this trick yet, but notice when I, when I highlight a line, a little blue dot turns up. If you drag that, you can make it into a curve, which gives you more space. It can give you a slightly different shape as well. And once you've done it once, other other points turn up as well. This is going to look very ugly, but I'll just do it so it's possible. It looks really ugly. Just right-click on the line and choose Straighten, and you get rid of it again. But I'll just, again, I'll make a bit of space there this way. So I've now defined... I hope I haven't stuffed it up by this stuff up with K, but we'll soon see. Let's now graph the employment level. So right click, take a copy of lambda, pop it down here. Notice it's pointing the wrong direction, so if I do click and go flip, it turns it around. I'll save that and hope that it works OK. And let's see, divide by infinity, OK. Now the program used to show me where the errors were at the moment, the circle's not working. I didn't define a value for the capital output ratio. 
that's the error. But in, with the program did and it will again put a little circle around the errors and definitions. We're in a redesign pro process at the moment and that's been lost. Divide by infinity again. Okay, I haven't defined labour productivity. So let's make that... Oh, that's one that's defined. And I haven't defined population. Let's get a population of 100. Okay, now let's see what happens. You get cycles. So I've now got booms and busts going on in the economy. And notice I've got wages here. Let's just take a copy of wages. Bring that over here. And if I now bring another chart down, I, it's one feature I haven't used yet, which you can probably see, which is as well as having buttons on the side, I've got buttons down the bottom here as well. If I right click and choose to take a copy of Lambda and attach Lambda to the black input as well, I'm now doing an XY chart. So now simulate it, let's slow it down a bit, it'll happen fairly rapidly. You now show the limit cycle that's involved there. So that's a very, very fast <laughs> introduction to how you use Minsky. The two components of it, the idea is to bring the two together. So you model financial flows using the double entry bookkeeping and you model physical flows using the flowchart. The ambition ultimately is make it possible to define like a scale of view of the economy and then just right click and say you want to have a multi-sector view. Let's say you want 10 sectors, it then creates a vector view which would have actually 10 sectors created. All the labour and capital flows that are necessary to make it logically happen are defined. You could then bring in data to match that to what your sectoral dynamics actually are. And then again another right click and you would find another country. So an entire simulation becomes a country. Take a copy of that. How many countries do you want? Let's say four. And then make your characteristics and your model international trade. And then all the all the, the program would generate all the logic behind it. You wouldn't need to write it. That's the intention. But if you look at what's been done so far, we've defined the basic equations that um, that Goodwin used for that model. And I've cheated a bit because I've got a constant population and I've got constant labour productivity. So another trick I've added, if we right click on a variable like that, notice you've got add integral down here. If I click on that, I can now come down here and I can define the population as a variable that changes over time. So I'm going to have, you know, I use beta beforehand in the other models to indicate the rate of population growth. Let's say that rate is, say, 2% per annum. Take a copy of n. Ah, I made a copy of the integral block, which I didn't want to do. We might actually get rid of that feature. You don't really need to have two integral blocks in the system. Uh, so copy the variable and then multiply beta by n, this, which is the rate of change of population integrated. There's your population level determined. And then let's do the same for labour productivity. So add an integral for that. And let's say labour productivity goes at, say, 1% per annum. So have alpha. Give it a var of 0.01. I could make this into a slider, but I'll just, and I could make it into a parameter as well, but I'm just doing this very quickly. Uh, copy the labour productivity. Ah, again, the same mistake. Just delete it. Right click, choose copy variable. Multiply labour productivity by the rate of, 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 of technical change. Again, that could be a variable in a more complicated model. Uh, I'll save that as a different file name in case I make a stuff up there. So I'll call that um, Goodman 1967. I'll call it 1967G for growth. And now you'll see something different happen over here because, of course, wages are going to rise over time. I hope. We'll soon find out. OK. You've now got rising wages over time. And if I wanted to graph output, let's just grab a hold of output. So for Y, take a copy of that, and let's graph output on another chart. I'll move this one up a bit.
You now you've got booms and busts in the economy being modelled. No debt in the system, so the booms and busts will never become fatal. And it's also possible to draft the rate of change of, of something as well. So I'll show you that. If I, let's put a, I'll just move these around. So again, actually I'm just, just grab that, that lot, group that, move it over here, ungroup. Uh, and let's whack another graph in here and resize that a bit. Let's say you want to graph the rate of change of GDP. Then I take a copy of Y. And if I then, ah, hang on, do it there. I'll just straighten that line. But, uh, hang on, let's just make it. If I now bring down a differential block, which is shown up here, DDX, if I differentiate Y, and divide that by y. Of course I've got the I've got the rate of change. Let's just label that as a rate of change rate of growth. You get booms and busts. You see it That sort of dynamic. It's also possible to illustrate things. Uh, we we use a lot of, of operator overloading. So you notice there's divide by. If I bring down a constant, but do you say you want to show that percentage terms? You want to multiply it by 100. So I type 100 here and drag 100 down onto that block. It lets me overload. So this was in in fractions beforehand, it's not going to be in percentages. Okay. So that's a quick demo of using Minsky. Lots more to it. That's that's the basic intro. And uh, of course, it's the program has only had about uh, two and a half thousand hours of programming time going into it, which is trivial. You think about things like Microsoft Excel and Word, there's hundreds of, probably millions of hours of programming time. Not that you can actually tell sometimes. Um, so there's a lot more I'd want to do with it, but this is the basics. And it's free, open source. It sort of runs on Apple. We have some problems on Apple at the moment, I'm not quite certain why. So did you get it working okay? Yeah. Oh, good, okay, great. So that's good to know, so show, show later. So like, I might stop there and take some questions now, and then I'm going to fall asleep while sitting up.